Qatar is hosting the UN's annual climate change conference. One of the big issues that will be addressed at the 12-day event will be extending the Kyoto Protocol, which expires at the end of next month. Al Jazeera's Nick Clark has more. Yes, day one of the conference here in Doha. Thousands of delegates from 190 countries taking part, trying to re-engage in this process, in this battle against climate change. Three main prongs of attack. First up, extending the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, there's not universal, by any, universal agreement by any means on that, so there's going to be a big battle there. Secondly, trying to find universal accord for 2015 between developing and developed nations for implementation on reducing carbon emissions in 2020. And thirdly, unravelling the complex world of climate finance. All this pulled into sharp focus by the big weather events we're seeing around the world. There's one going on right now in the United Kingdom. A lot of heavy rain putting parts of the country under one and a half metres of water. Simon McGregor Wood has this report. Great swathes of England under flood water. Torrential downpours and storm force winds combining to cause massive disruption. And all after one of the wettest summers on record. In the ancient town of Malmesbury, the river Avon burst its banks, flooding the centre of town. Saturated local farmland meant the latest downpour had nowhere to go. David Whitby and his family had to flee their home in the dead of night. Yeah, yeah that's the high water mark there. Right. He loves the river, but wonders now if he should move. You just can't cope with it. You know, as I said, we were coping with eight inches of water because, you know, that's that. we expect that. We live by the river. But when it's three feet deep and the electricity goes off and therefore the heating doesn't work and, you know, etc., etc., it just becomes uninhabitable. The British government's latest report into climate change says that flooding is the big challenge facing this country. Increased rainfall from changing weather patterns and a rise in sea level and the ill effects of building too close to rivers could make these kinds of incidents almost routine. We're an island and so um, we suffer from uh, sea flooding and uh, uh, sea level rise, but also we have large floodplains in the UK which have historically been built on. Uh, and I think finally we're seeing a lot more paving over of green spaces in cities which will exacerbate the problem because water has nowhere to run off when it comes down in these heavier bursts that we're seeing. The government report says the way things are going, more and more people will be exposed to flood risk, five million by the end of the century, and the annual cost of repairing the damage, eight billion dollars a year. And then there's damage to businesses, the loss of farming land, and the impact on the country's road network. All in all, a huge impact on the country's economy at a time of deep recession. In Malmesbury, they're clearing up and mucking out, counting the cost of living close to the river they love, but wondering if their future lies elsewhere. Simon McGregor Wood, Al Jazeera, in Malmesbury, southern England. Well, Al Jazeera has spoken to people right around the world about their concerns over climate change and how they're personally affected. Have a listen to this. There was water seven to eight metres deep. Now the amount of our crops has dropped. There is no humidity and it rains very little. Not enough. The quality of our fruits have also gone down. This water comes from the springs that are fed by the glaciers. If the water is gone, we will all have to leave. For me, climate change feels personal. The amount of the cars we have, polluting the air, and the factories, who knows what they would do to our environment. Of course, keeping the temperature rise to below 2 degrees C is the target. But we've been hearing from the World Bank who are saying that we're on course for a 4 degree rise by the end of the century if things aren't changed because carbon emissions keep on going up. And that's the backdrop to the discussions here in Doha as they try to make things work in the days ahead. Well, these UN-sponsored talks have been going on for two decades now. So what's been achieved in that time? Well, in 1990, a UN panel concluded that man-made greenhouse gases are increasing the temperature of the Earth. They called for action. After seven years of negotiations, the Kyoto Protocol was born. All of the world's industrialised nations signed on. They pledged to reduce emissions to below 1990 levels. That accord took effect in 2005, but by then the agreement had been watered down. The US, which initially signed on, didn't ratify the deal, meaning it wasn't required to meet any of its obligations. And China, the world's biggest polluter, wasn't required to reduce emissions. 
the Kyoto Protocol expires at the end of this year. And the way forward is what the summit in Doha is all about. Well, joining us now from Washington, D.C., for more on these talks is Rick Piltz. He's a founder and director of Climate Science Watch. Thanks very much indeed for being with us. Uh, just on the issue of the United States and not kind of committed to, to the Kyoto Protocol, are any dis discussions of climate change without that participation valid? Well, I don't know about the Kyoto Protocol. The United States is not going to become a party to that. But I think the next step is going beyond that to the agreement uh, that uh, the countries have agreed from Durban last year to reach by 2015. That will be a global agreement that needs to include the United States as well as uh, the other countries um, with uh, some kind of legal agreement on limiting emissions. So I don't that, expect yeah. that. Go ahead. No, I was going to say. Do you, I mean, does, do you I don't that expect the, that this conference in Doha will 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 lead to that, but hopefully, it will make progress toward that. But do you think that the the, the kind of the the atmosphere has changed in the United States at all on climate change? Because it, it it seemed that before there was a lot of kind of resistance to the whole idea of it. Has that shifted at all? Do you think? And will that make any difference in terms of what the U.S. can do? Yes, I think it has shifted. It's not clear how much difference it will make. Uh, the severe weather events, the effects of Hurricane Sandy on the East Coast, having most of the uh, country affected by a historic severe drought, uh, severe wildfires in the West, uh, does get people's attention. And uh, they do connect it with global warming. The public opinion survey data indicate that most people understand that there is global warming and that they would support some government action to deal with it. But that public opinion has not really been mobilized and focused uh, either from the grassroots, although there is now a climate movement working to do that, and it has not had the leadership from the top. It hasn't had the top U.S. leadership articulating the problem and mobilizing public, public support for strong action. That still remains to be done. Uh, and in the past, I mean, the, the U.S. has refused to sign up to any treaty unless uh, China, uh, which is the world's biggest emitter, also cuts its emissions. Do you think that it's fair for the United States to tie it to what China does? Or, or do, and do you think that's still the, the position? Well, it's a global problem, and it will require global participation. But one problem, I think, with the U.S. position, and constrained by domestic politics to be sure is the U.S. wants to point to current and projected future emissions uh, fast rising in developing countries uh, most prominently China and make an agreement based on that but there is the question of the historic emissions that have caused this problem in the first place and so the U.S. and other industrialized countries have grown wealthy in fossil fuel comfort, if you will, uh, but don't want to take responsibility uh, for that, those uh, historic contributions to the problem in allocating um, future commitments. Now, if you have a goal of uh, keeping global warming below 2 degrees C, as the countries uh, in, in the climate negotiations over the last couple of years have agreed to, how much carbon emissions globally uh, uh, does that leave okay. to be negotiated? Right. You'll find that I think that the, 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 all of the countries that are producers of oil and gas and coal already have known reserves that are far beyond okay. what would be necessary to raise that global temperature. So right. how do you right. allocate yeah, the right. cuts and how do you allocate the carbon budget fairly. Okay. And that's so, what needs to be negotiated. Rick Pills, thanks very much indeed. Sorry to interrupt you there, just uh, running out of time there. Thanks. Thank you. And you can see our complete coverage of the climate negotiations by visiting our interactive web page. Timeline of past conferences, background material, uh, and how the negotiation process works, all on there.